Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. It is yours truly, Chris Leander with Ghost Girl Diaries Paranormal Podcast. I'm really excited to chat today. Today is, it can be a touchy subject. So I want to give you guys kind of a backstory on why I chose this topic. Other than the fact that it is uh, we have Women's History Month, where we're doing the Women's International Day um, Ode to Women, right? And Women Empowerment. I... Have, I have made an unconventional friendship last year. And uh, and I say it's unconventional because obviously not only we're in quarantine with COVID, but also um, she was my mother's nurse. <clears throat> and my mom, as you guys know, has had health issues. She um, needed somebody to come in and take care of her daily to like change uh, bandages for wounds. She had surgery on her foot. And um, this person was her nurse. And her name is Julie. Shout out to Julie. I know that sometimes she watches my stuff. She's a little bit older than me, not by much. Um, she's an RN. Uh, she's African American. And we became friends really quickly, not only because she was coming to my house every day, but she really liked my mom and I. Um, our energy is, is very high energy, uh, very proud, as you guys know, to be Cherokee, um, Native American. And I really think that powerful women attract other powerful women and, and you build each other up. And uh, Julie found out, uh, you know, my history with paranormal. And one day we kind of got into a chat about the South and about, um, you know, genocide of Native Americans. And not only that, like I, I told her, you know, it's so hard to trace um, roots back with Native roots because some documentation didn't even exist then. And then she started saying, yeah, well, you know, with slavery, you know, my family was brought over from West Africa and I am literally untraceable. And we really just, I don't know, we hit it off, became friends really fast, had these really in-depth discussions about the South. It can be <clears throat> a touchy subject. However, I think it can be done properly. I'm also not one to shy away, as you guys know, from uh, controversial topics and I think you guys will really find it interesting, sort of the route that I'm going to take while we're kind of talking about this. I'd like to think of today as sort of like a paranormal history lesson, because I feel like at the end of the day, when it comes to paranormal, we all are history nerds. We all love history and the roots of history and where history starts and begins. And um, I, I also want to dissect, while Elfie and I talk about this discussion, um, you know, other paranormal groups or even television series, especially television series, that have gone to places like where the Underground Railroad has been, or plantations, especially plantations, and even touch on a little bit of the voodoo queen because she has, um, you know, her ancestors, her mother was uh, a released slave and her father was Native American. I believe she was, uh, I think, Chickawa? I mean, I might not be right on that. Um, but I want to kind of just tap into all those little things and sort of tie it together. <clears throat> and we t I talked with Elfie a couple of days ago. And Elfie was a little nervous because she was like, whoa, this could be like a really dangerous territory conversation. And I feel like that's the problem is, and not her, not Elfie, <laughs> not Elfie. Elfie's not the problem. <laughs> um, the problem with, with it not being publicly talked about more is it shows that there can be like white fragility and that can also be um, a delicate conversation for sort of white privilege. And I just feel like after speaking with Julie and having her African roots around me and, and she's just such a dear friend now and really getting her side of the spectrum. Also, she knows my spectrum of Cherokee and the genocide my family, you know, inherited, which was the Trail of Tears, like I'm lucky to even be sitting here right now after what my family endured. And I just think we need to bring some light and talk about some of the parts of the plantations that are really, really haunted. There's some amazing roots down there, but I feel like it's never really discussed why the roots are so inherently haunted. 
Um, and it's because there was actual torture and abuse that took place there. So shout out. I am bringing in my co-host, Miss Elfie. How are you today, Miss Elfie? Yay, I'm good. You look so witchy today. I love the vibe. Like, we look like we should be a coven, you know? <laughs> Oh, did you? Good. Yeah, I love the, like, backdrop. That looks good. Like, you're vibing. Oh, and we have the, the Luciferian book over the shoulder. I love that. That's a vibe. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. It looks great. Okay, so, um, what, so let's chat. Okay, somebody, we're saying they can't hear you. Let's see here. Let me turn you up. Try it again. Go ahead and test again. Testing, testing. Is that better? Let me. I'm have cat text me. Let me know. Say do do testing one more time, Elfie. Testing, testing. Okay, cat. Let me know. Just hang tight for one second. No. Okay. I know. I'm getting texts from my entire production crew saying we can't hear Elfie. I know, but I turned her up. Can you guys hear her now? How about now? <laughs> Elfie, how about right now? Uh, louder, okay. I turned louder? her all the way up. I turned her all the way up. Hang on one second. Okay, one more time. Can you hear me? Okay, let's try it. No, no subtitles. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. She's all the way up. We got, okay. We got her. <laughs> it's because Elfie's so soft-spoken, guys, you know? She's too far away from like, the mic or something. Who knows? <laughs> no, it's fine. No, you are. She's. I, I told Elfie the other day on the phone, he said, I love your energy because she's so soft-spoken and she's articulate when she speaks. And I love to watch. I, I know this sound, I'm such a people watcher. It's probably my Aquarius moon. But I love when Elfie, like, you can see her thinking. And, like, I live for that. <laughs> Because I feel like critical thinking is, like, so hard to come by nowadays. You know what I mean? Okay. You can see the little dogs moving. Like. Yes. I love that. So, okay. So, Elfie, I was I was telling everybody, I love your backdrops. So now we can hear her. Thank God. Um, okay. So, Underground Railroad. So, one of the first things you said that I really also loved when we, t we chatted mm -hmm. about this a few days ago was you said a lot of people have misconceptions of the Underground Railroad is an actual railroad. Yeah, I think, like, well, I mean, I especially remember, like, like, if you remember in school, the basic, like, history, and they talk about the Underground Railroad, I think lots of people get this idea that it was, like, laid out tunnels or, like, physical, a physical trail to freedom and everything. And it, if you actually look at the books, it's more like a whole lot of, like, chunks of trail to freedom mm -hmm. well it's there like were the, and there are some secret passageways but yeah. not large secret passageways it would be like from one farmer to the next or or you know a tunnel area but everything mm -hmm. was done via word of mouth and very secretive because they didn't want people to know there were white people helping slaves escape yeah that and also there were people who were actively searching out for escape plays and stuff to return them along the border along the trails everywhere so it was like you you had to be very careful who you could trust and talk to about because any one of them could just like grab you and like send you right back to where you started essentially right and that means when you were completely escaped let's say a slave does escape that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're out of the woods no you could still be it. sent back. You could still be found out. There were sort of, I guess you could look at it as people that were hunting for escapees because slaves mm -hmm. were actually considered property. And it, well, that it, and there were rewards on their head, too. Like, you, you got money for bringing back, and this was interesting, both people, like, they would grab anyone whether or not they believed they were actually escaped slave or they were actually a free person they could still grab and go nope you're escape slave we're going to take you back because they would give money for each person they would bring back right Didn't all based via skin color which is just crazy um mm -hmm. so 
a lot of the Underground Railroad, too, wasn't just, like Elfie and I are talking, like, secret tunnels, secret passageways, um, people guiding people. Like, it, it was a very secretive sort of plan. But it was also just, like, basic shelter where people would allow sl- escaped slaves to stay, mm-hmm. like, if they were tired from the journey. Uh, but, you know, imagine how careful you would have to be. You're at a time with no social media. Really, do maps even exist? And if they do, they're hand-drawn. I mean, a slave probably wouldn't be able to come across something like a compass. So you'd have to be careful which house you're knocking on to make sure that that's the correct location. You could be in trouble and be, once again, be caught, captured, sent back. Yeah, I'm guessing there, I mean, there were maps back then, but I'm guessing there were probably not many, like, it, it's not like when you go to a visitor center, like, here's a map of this town or something. And there wasn't like, hey, here's your map. Go, good luck. Have a, it's, it's like, a lot of times they talked about using stars and very basic tracking to, or uh, even um, markings along the way to, to find your way there. Like, I think one of the problems was there wasn't a lot of a recorder at times on the moment because they didn't want people to find out at that moment this that this area was the area that they would should look for. Right. Which also, because it could be, because even the white settlers, if they were helping escapees, they could get in trouble as well, right? So mm-hmm. find, because once again, you're talking about people that were considered actual property. Now, this was interesting, something I didn't know, which was 1786, and this is when um, George Washington had basically filed a sort of a formal complaint It was against these people called the Quakers. The Quakers were considered the very first organizational group to actively help escaped slaves. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy. So even before that, how how long it's been, this is like the early 1800s now, and now we're all trying to set this up to try to capture these people. There's bounties on people that are trying to help the, the, the slaves escape, and then there's bounties on the actual slaves to try to send them back. So once again, we kind of go back to the root of America, which is money talks with everything. Mm-hmm. It's always oh, yeah. based on, and the same with witch, witches, right? Like we go back to Salem, like Kat and I talked about last week. It, it started about like, oh, she, she could be doing witchcraft. But slowly over time, it turns into, oh, well, the more people we accuse of witchcraft, we can take their land and the government owns it. And once again, about money, about property value. So it may start as one thing, but it always ends up getting uh, triggered into this dysfunctional mess of, well, money is the root of all evil. Yeah, and a lot of the, like you were talking about, like the the laws to stop people from helping. I mean, even though we hear about when with North Northern states were free states, it was still, even though once they hit those states, it was never guaranteed that they were safe. It was more like, a lot of them just kept going to Canada because then they were definitely more protected because even in the northern states, they were very, it was heavily discouraged from uh, helping them, uh, keeping them safe somewhere, doing anything, basically just like they were, they didn't like that because there were many people helping them and they were trying to make laws to stop this. Well, it's also too, you know, the whole thing is just, is so sad because you know, you're even thinking about just a regular American family that was what, quote, a Yankee, which is literally where Cat lives, right? Which is, and you, you both live in North States, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, even if you were able to take in a family full of slaves, like now you're, you're, you know, even to help them, you have to feed them, clothe them, home them. And that's expensive. You know, like as much as you'd want to help them, I mean, at that time, you're talking about industrialization of like farming, People aren't really making that much money to be able to help everybody on a permanent basis. So I'm sure there were people that wanted to help that financially didn't even have the means. And that's scary because you're right. You're going up north. It's colder in the winters. What what are you going to do? You can't be homeless. But yet these people have no shelter, nowhere to go. Yeah. And well, I mean, the thing was a lot of times... It seemed like once they got up north and they got to places that could help them, they were able to help establish them some place to work and live and everything. And even though there was a lot of abolitionists and everything, there was seemed to be a difference between abolitionists who were definitely against slavery, but then abolitionists who actively tried to prevent it. And that's mostly out of 
some people were just afraid because of such the um, penalties for mm-hmm. helping. And Consequences, everything. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Jail time, I mean, who knows, purgatory, literally. I mean, if we were oh, yeah, capable like, of, of right, hanging right. our own women in Salem, why wouldn't we just kill people that were hiding what's considered property? I mean, one of the reverends, like, he got, I think, in prison, like, twice, and he still kept going around talking about anti-slavery and basically doing the same thing. He's like, yep, throw me in jail, I'm going to keep doing it. Now, another thing I found interesting was the earliest mention that can be found in the books of the Underground Railroad was in 1831. So that means from mm-hmm. 1786 to 1831, the Underground Railroad has been just sort of hush-hushed. And they've kept it under such tight lip, tight wraps... So all of the people involved really were doing sort of a miracle by being able to keep it under such wraps for, what, a good 50 years? Well, I think it was also that, but also I think they just didn't really have a... There wasn't really a name for a name for organization, and then someone made a comment when they were being freed, and it just kind of stuck, and, like, the newspapers just kind of ran with it, and it just became a thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And then suddenly now everyone's sort of on edge aware of, oh, your slaves could escape by, via people helping. Mm-hmm. And now we're all on edge because that's our property and we don't want them to escape. So now I want to tie this into one of the most famous plantations, which is Myrtle's Plantation. Mm-hmm. As we know, it's in Louisiana. Um, there's been so many investigators, television series, go to Myrtle's Plantation, do investigations. That includes Ghost Adventures. Um, and I just feel, I, I've never felt comfortable with the way things really like went when they were at these locations. I feel like the topic of slavery is sort of like, oh yeah, like this is where like, you know, this is the cellar where the slaves were kept and there were some horrible things done and like, yeah, this is slave property. Oh, and it's really haunted and the ghosts that are here. And then they go into really in in detail about the ghosts and you're mm-hmm. like, wait a second. Like, do you understand how the ghosts got there? Do you understand that, like, humans were, like, vilely tortured under a constant basis, murdered, picked apart, starved? Like, I mean, actual, like, desecration took place on this land. That's why it's haunted. And I feel like it's never... Don't, don't you feel like it's kind of skated over a little bit? Yeah, it's it's one of those like. It, it's definitely I can see it's a touchy topic because you like you said, uh, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures has done a show on it. Uh, it was on Unsolved Mysteries back in the day, so it has been on a lot of shows. And the only uh, they they'll briefly mention about um, the slavery and mostly just just to emphasize uh, the ghost of Clo- uh, Chloe. And just kind of like, and eh, moving on to the next thing. Right. And then the famous and ghost Chloe, Chloe, which we will talk about. <laughs> and then and it's briefly mentioned like, oh, Chloe, Chloe was a slave. And it's like, but wait a minute. Like, it's not just Chloe was a slave. Like, she wasn't the only slave that was there. And how, mm-hmm. how do you know you're not literally walking across land where there's bodies buried? I mean, I, I would assume so. I wouldn't you? I mean, if the slaves well, didn't I mean, mind them, they were tortured and killed. And, and there were oftentimes some on some of the plantations, there would be areas that were marked out specifically grave spots for them. Um, but yeah, there could be times when we're not sure because there were just simple markers that could have been like removed at some point too. Mm-hmm. I mean, that happens all the time with graveyard. So the the first half of Myrtle's plantation was built in 1796. So this is like the perfect time. And also, if you guys remember, um, slavery was it basically brought over by ships and boats from Western Africa. And the sort of hub was Louisiana. The hub of slavery was Louisiana, the French Quarter. And of course, we know plantations are all in the South, but the hub started obviously in, in Louisiana. So that's what makes, I think, the history so old when you're talking about plantations in this area. Um, now, there were new owners that bought it that obviously have done restoration. Um, it's huge. I think people are always... I'm going to give a, a, a view of what I think modern culture is when they look at a plantation. 
they're like, oh my gosh, it's a it's a white mansion, white picket fence. It's what the storybooks told us we're supposed to live in for our happy ending someday when we get married. A white mansion, white picket fence, you know, lush green, uh, you know, fields, trees. It's beautiful. This was a, sh but you're like, wait a second. Like a plantation usually means there were, there were slavery that happened there. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's just never, Elfie brought up a good point the other day. She said, how do you feel about people getting married on plantations? And I personally, now like, and I'm not judging anyone that's done it. I'm just saying personally, could I ever do it? No, I don't think so. Why? Because a lot of reasons. One, I just feel like it, it's blatant disrespectful for the people that did suffer there and, and had desecration and their lives were ended. And, and not even if their lives were ended, just the suffering that took place there. Of course, that's going to harbor a lot of like negative, depressive energy. But the other thing that I don't think it's really talked about is, you know, with slavery, with West Africa migrating to America, hoodoo and voodoo practices were very popular. And who knows if the land was cursed by, you know, the slaves, which should have been. I mean, in my opinion, like Native American culture, if it's if you disrespect us in Native American culture, we will curse the land. Like you hear about that all over the place. Like, oh, the land's cursed. Yeah, I bet you it is. If it was taken from natives, why wouldn't that happen if there was torture going on on the actual premises? So, I mean, would I get married on a plantation? I don't know how people can do it. What's your opinion on it, Elfie? Well, I think, I think it's now much more of a relevant topic with everything that has been going in the last couple of years. And it's taking people more to pause to think about this because on one hand, you see these locations that are definitely beautiful historic locations in the South. And it's more that romantic, romanticizing of the old South, of these buildings. I mean, that structurally they are beautiful, but too often I think it's then overlooked at possibly the darker history of it. I mean, like we were saying with the investigations, people focus more on the, um, maybe the aesthetics of the location and spookiness than the 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 history and the humanness of it and that might be is what is now unfortunately more a uncomfortable reality people are now having to really look at because i don't think these places should be like swept away but they should people should look at them more closely when they're seeing these places and it was definitely an interesting topic when I looked into it about the whole plantations weddings and people just see a beautiful building mm -hmm. but it's not always looked at at the undercurrent of the history of what made that building and why it's there mm -hmm. absolutely well I was even thinking about it and comparing it to when I had my wedding I was um, looking at mansion, haunted man. I wanted it to be a haunted mansion in Colorado, but those mm -hmm. mansions are not related to being plantations or slavery. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's a very big different vibe if you're comparing just a haunted mansion, like just without that sort of dark, gloomy history, and then comparing it to, I don't know why you would want, you like, you know, a, a day of exchange of vows. It's supposed to be... You know, a holy day, maybe not religiously, maybe just to each other as partners. I don't know why you would want to share that on a property where human beings were tortured. You know what I mean? Like that just seems very strange to me. Maybe that's also because I'm an energy, you know, worker and reader and I, I feel that energy. And I, I can't imagine having a romantic day that's supposed to be about you and your loved one and even sharing it with other loved ones. And, you know, I have to put my my feet or my persona in the in the positions of possibly energies that haven't crossed over so if you're talking about tortured slaves that are on the property of like for example Myrtle's plantation that have not crossed over and they're looking at a bunch of white people gather on the property to, to get married yet they're like stuck in the gray zone it's it's sort of like history repeating itself it's a very strange correlation for me to see. Because um, even when I was speaking with Julie about this, which is my mom's nurse who's also African-American, 
she finds it very strange that it's not sort of respected more in a different sense of an ode to the culture sort of like how native land is an ode to like native americans and like where their properties or reservations are and plantations are just not viewed in that sense yeah and it's very interesting so it it does make you wonder how far have we come with you know not only as a society but even as paranormal why isn't it discussed more why isn't the history discussed more of like the vile things that happen to these people i guess i just don't get it because if i were like filming on set i would want to give ode to more of of what these poor people endured they're just humans like you and i it shouldn't have anything to do with skin color and it's very it's strange yeah well interesting enough in my research i did come across a plantation uh called whitney plantation that was apparently bought a few years ago and the owner actually has made that into a museum to um openly to basically open that conversation up about slavery the history of it and its connection with plantations and Mm -hmm. he actually did it very uh interesting with he does he has a historian there he does talks he also has art installations in connection to the history of it and just re even though he did he brought the plantation itself back to what used to be he also focused heavily on this is what it was built on or built for and everything to to bring more awareness to it as well Mm -hmm. well i think that's amazing i think every location should do that 100 percent. but you Mm -hmm. had even had a really good fact the other day where you said you know obviously we have ghost brothers which is the only of color group out there doing paranormal and then you have all these other groups that are obviously whitewashed as we know they're going into these locations um, investigating do you really think slaves are going to want to have a conversation with a bunch of white people is what Elfie said and I thought that was like a great point Oh, I mean, and actually, like, it was interesting, I think, goes for the episode with Magnolia Plantation and approaching that and trying to, to understand, even they brought up the, the whole thing of who would who would they actually want to speak to, why, why would they want to talk to any paranormal investigators if all this was happening and everything. And it's one of those things, I think, not just with plantations, but probably this is kind of a more... Uh, conversation we should open up with all these locations because a lot of ghost huntings go on at places where a lot of pain and suffering happen. I mean, this is oftentimes where we talk about where the energy happens, but we seem to gloss over that part. Mm-hmm. We're more focused on like, ooh, spooky stuff instead of like, pain happened here, death happened here. And it's not just to, it's not to drag it down, but to be aware of it Mm -hmm. now with that being said i this is something we (laughs) we chatted about ghost adventures today earlier Mm -hmm. and you know and i'm not it's not just comparing ghost adventures there's been other um like series of different investigators that have gone to plantations and the question is what's an appropriate trigger object and what is not Because I've Mm -hmm. seen some people that have tried to trigger the entities by using discussions of slavery and discussions of abuse and torture, and I think that's wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that absolutely you would probably get um, evidence from that, but like morally and ethically, I don't know how you can do that. Yeah, I just, I don't appreciate that, you know? I, I think that they endured enough while they were embodying themselves on this planet, and I don't think in the afterlife they need to be tortured any more than they were. So Ghost Adventures wanted to incorporate some voodoo work with um, their investigation. Myrtles turned them down. I'm okay. So once again, I'm gonna. I've said this before. People hear the word voodoo hoodoo and they automatically think it's black magic. It's Mm -hmm. not necessarily. There is good and bad with every type of magic. Just because Ghost Adventures wanted to bring in someone to practice voodoo, I think he was using that as a trigger object to sort of want to make the energies feel comfortable because they were known to practice that also as sort of a prayer, practicing magic to get them out of the circumstance they were in. So do do you think that was appropriate to use like a voodoo even though they weren't allowed to do it? 
I I don't know. The thing was like, if I remember correctly, the show they were working off of a a legend of supposedly someone who practiced there and was the cause of a death, and they were hoping that if they brought in someone who who practiced voodoo to do a ritual, that it would stir up stuff. But I felt it might have been a little. It it looked to me a little more sensationalizing than doing something respectful. Because mm-hmm. I think you could do a a maybe a remembrance ritual, a offering ritual, something to give whatever there's peace mm-hmm. or uh, show respect. But I feel like this was more in the vein of let's make a sensational because unfortunately, voodoo and hoodoo on TV is always way too oversimplified, too too diluted, and there's a lot more depth to it than. Unless you're an actual practitioner, then anyone knows, really. Well, no, it's true, because I... Pers- and I think this is uh, Hollywood and the media's fault. Because I think yeah. that... And I have studied hoodoo and voodoo. Do I practice it? No, I don't. Actually, there's an egg spell I do. I believe in the egg spell, where you, like, go over your body and it removes the negative oh. energy from you. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's an amazing spell. Um, but with hoodoo and voodoo, I think that, you know, once again, the media, once like Elfie says, has it sensationalized it to... Um, the first thing I think of, even being educated on hoodoo and voodoo, is the kind of hoodoo and voodoo they practice in the Caribbean where they supposedly can bring back the dead. Mm-hmm. And I blame it on Hollywood and the media because that's everything you hear about hoodoo and voodoo is associated with zombies and bringing mm-hmm. your loved one back from the dead. And so I think that immediately you hear those words and you're like, oh, God. Like, that's really bad. Don't mess with that stuff. And it's like, no, it's really... Even like Brujeria, I was talking about with Kat last week. That's also mixed up. You can get that mixed up. And there's just, there's balance with everything. There's good, bad, and gray with everything, with all magic practices. But I do agree that I think Ghost Adventures likes the dark side of stuff. Um, Ooh, someone just brought up something really good. A noose wouldn't be a good trigger object. I want to talk about that for a minute. Please don't. <laughs> I, um, when I was on set with Pilgrim when I was filming, I have never talked about this before, and I thought that this was the perfect stream to have this conversation, okay? We were prepping. I was signed to Pilgrim. I had the series that I was supposed to be on. I was literally, like, two days from leaving to fly to London. I was going to England to start filming this episodic series, And we had some really intense production meetings before we were leaving the States because obviously it's very in-depth when you're shooting a series, right? Mm -hmm. So I had, um, I'm just going to call him out because he was on there. There's uh, the guy named Greg that was on Killer Contact. Greg was also on Paranormal Challenge, okay? Greg was on the... Uh, I think it was the Haunted Ship episode of of Paranormal Challenge, so if you want to look it up, you're more than welcome to. Greg um, was recruited pretty much at the same time with me. Um, Our our energy clashed immediately, and then when we got into the production meetings, it got worse. Greg at the time, and people can change, okay? Greg at the time was pretty misogynistic, and I'm pretty sure at this point everybody knows I'm pretty... pretty much a feminist I think we know that at this point okay so if you put someone that's a misogynist in with someone that's a feminist and have a conversation it doesn't go very well okay and I also have my spiritualism with my Native American which I believe energies should be respected period Mm -hmm. respected period we were going to be planning on doing possibly some slave work um, you know where slaves had passed away And we were talking about doing locations with the Mayan temples. And that was in Mexico. And once again, you're talking about different cultures. It needs to be respected, period. Because my ancestors are Cherokee and I expect them to be respected. I expect the trauma they endured with the Trail of Tears to be respected. And uh, Greg was basically in charge of coming up with ideas for trigger objects while we were on set. And he told the crew that for any of the slave locations and the Mayan locations, his, his decision on trigger objects were nooses. 
And he had brought the nooses in that day to the meeting. This was two days before I was supposed to leave for London, okay? I flipped shit. I'm just going to be honest. I flipped shit. Um, I couldn't even believe, like, who are you? Are you human? Like, you're misogynist, fine. But are you a human? Like, do you have any value for life? Like, and he was dead serious. He He's holding the nooses, and we're in the production meeting, and, like, I'm throwing a fit talking to the executive producers, freaking out, because I just think this is, like, the most disrespectful thing. At this point, I don't even want to be on set with this a-hole, because, like, I don't know what's going to happen. We get to the Mayan temples... Or, or a plantation, what other I, horrible ideas is he going to come up with? You know what I mean? So we're in the production meeting, and he's cocky, misogynistic, thinks I'm a stupid woman. He's slapping the nooses on the table. He thinks they're funny. I got the noose. I think he even used one in the Mayan temple. And, uh, you know, man, what's wrong with people? That's all I have to say. You know what I mean? Like... I wouldn't want my culture disrespected. So long story short was a lot of people have asked me all these years why I quit Pilgrim. And that was one of the reasons. I got into a really bad fight with a couple of the executive producers because I was disgusted that you would uh, disrespect African-American heritage and culture that way. Disgusted you would disrespect uh, Mayan Mexican culture that way. And there was no way in hell I was going to have my name tied to something as racist as using a noose on a paranormal series. Yeah, no, that's... Actually, I'm more surprised not everyone in me just looked at it and go, what the hell? I'm pretty sure he had the noose for the Mayan episode that's Killer Contact. You guys would have to look it up probably on Amazon Prime. Oh, um, I but I don't know if you want to. They may have cut. I can't remember. I think I did watch the episode when it finally came out. Um, but I rem- I don't. So I don't remember if they kept it, the footage in or not. But I don't know. Like this is where it comes down to. This is like the point of the stream is like being a paranormal investigator. Um, no, not everything's demons, and yes, culture should be respected no matter what. And well, I mean, there's there's a difference between like you want to invoke a reaction but there's also this human decency and that's also just no there's like that's in any universe that's what doesn't know <laughs> well that would be like taking a noose to salem i mean it's you know it's just where and the thought process behind it like you know he made it seem like oh look it's just a noose but like do you understand the comprehension behind people hanging and dying and like how bad your death would be when you're being hung that way, whether it's a slave or not. Well, it's just that, and also, it still has, even today, it still has heavy weight behind it, and still is utilized, and still is absolutely, wrong. Absolutely, yeah, we've seen it show up in, in current day political issues. And so people know what they're doing when they're using those types of items. And I think mm-hmm. it's really inappropriate for... Um, paranormal investigators and I think it's even more inappropriate for production companies and executive producers to allow it well it's it's that it's that weighing that question of like how 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 desperately do you want evidence are you how much are you willing to like are you willing to do the most like not so good things just to get evidence is that how much you want it instead of being respectful person. Is it even the evidence, though? Because, I mean, you could even end up with a really bad attachment from doing something like that, you know? Like, I would love to even know a statistical value behind couples that get married at plantations that are really haunted, and then they get divorced later. Was it because there was a curse on the marriage? You know, like, there's got to be some sort of statistical value on that. Well, I mean, uh, the one interview I was watching about it is the, the woman who had gotten married um i don't believe she's married any longer but she spoke about at that time it wasn't it wasn't really something you were thinking about because uh most the most days most plantations are used utilized as bed and breakfasts and as venues for weddings but they're very much you you see the beautiful part of it you don't really think about the rest of it right that there's cells underground yeah she's like 
I, uh, think about it thinking about it now yeah that was probably not the best idea but at the time all i saw was this beautiful building and this beautiful venue to be utilized which the question is 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 it the people that are getting married at the plantation's fault or is it the people that own the plantations for allowing that to happen there you know, I mean, you could play devil's advocate on both sides. Somebody said, why do you have to trigger a negative response such as a noose? Why can't you bring fruit or another offering for a brotherhood gesture? Absolutely. That's what Elfie was saying is like, why can't you give an offering of, of a food that was served back then to, to make peace and give, give um, an odom to their life? And it's just... Well, Go ahead. Or well, even like putting out a drink or, or something in the drink or even water, some something of a sustenance to to show that you it's a give and take. That it's not just I'm here to take evidence and get something from you and then go. It's showing I actually respect this place and I wanna show my respect by giving you food, water, drink, a shot of something, whatever. Mm hmm Absolutely. I agree. Now, I want to keep going and go into the LaLaurie mm -hmm. Mansion here because I did want to talk about that one. So the LaLaurie Mansion, we've talked about this briefly before, 1832. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knows Marine, uh, Marie Delphine oh, was this horrible woman um, that owned the mansion, and she basically tor tortured and murdered the slaves in her household, including throwing a little girl off the roof um, at one point, and she was, I think she was acquitted for it, because once again, the slaves were considered, um, property, but, you know, well, you, it was also debated if she, if she threw her off, or she, or the girl herself just, like, jumped off, like, she, she didn't want to deal with the consequences, so she just left, so it was debate whether or not she tossed her, or she jumped. Right, which, I mean, she was, like, what, eight or eleven or something, which, I mean, I don't know why... Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you could be suicidal at that age if you wanted to get out that bad. But she was known for being so torturous, it wouldn't shock me. Um, now, the re this was really the core of why I wanted to do this stream because of, um, you know, Women's Month, International Women's Day. You know, a lot of people don't realize, too, that a lot of the torture that took place at some of these plantations may not even be the in the books that we know of. You know, the research that we do, it may not even be recorded. Like Elfie said, there may have been a grave that the marker was moved and that person was never considered a person. It was property, so they just buried them. And there were a lot of women slaves that were brought in that were raped, that would get killed if they got pregnant, would be forced into abortions. They would be beat until they had miscarriages. And I just think that's also overlooked a lot with the torture that went on with these places, which is, once again, why there should be even more respect going in as an investigator, is understanding that there could be history that isn't in the books that, that happened at this, this traumatic location. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still finding out new information and still un discovering stuff in a lot of it is a combination of deciphering records and deciphering notes here and there and also just oral history really absolutely 100 percent. well and back then they may not have kept records on slaves because they were considered property and i mean you could literally couldn't you go to the auction house and you get like thousand dollars or something and you'd get a new one if like one ran away or or, or it's, you know, even the owners will lie and say, oh, yeah, he ran away, I need a new one. And uh, they actually murdered him and killed him because he wasn't minding the property owner. And, and nobody cared. Nobody said anything. So I, I think there was a lot more trauma and torture done at these locations than people really know about. Kat said, bringing a noose to Salem would not be a good idea. She said, the energies will mess you up. Laugh out loud. Um, absolutely, I agree. I think it's just it would be disrespectful no matter what. Um, and that was why the idea of it while I was on set, my brain was not comprehending. There's so many other things you could do with going to a Mayan temple mm -hmm. than, than using a noose of all things, you know, like to, to have that opportunity to be at that ancient location. What would you, I mean, how would you communicate an offering? Wonderful. That'd be great. The, all of the equipment that we have. Um, even taking flowers as like a respect and a, uh, you know, thank you for your culture and heritage type of thing. Um, and it's strange that it's so hard for people to understand how in depth some, the reason these places are haunted. I, I feel like it shouldn't be that hard to comprehend. Do you, Elfie? 
Well, it's in these, honestly, I, these locations would be beautiful just to see, especially going to a Mayan temple. I would just be wandering around the, <laughs> the stonework and going, oh, just leave me here, I'll be fine. <laughs> right. But yeah, there's like so many better things that could be done than that. Right. And it's like, there's, yeah, like so much wrong there. <laughs> well, they were canceled after that first season, so now we know why, you know? Yeah. I feel like that was a good plan. <laughs> it was a good plan. There's there's better, I mean, it's one thing push boundaries. There's better ways to do it that was on one of them. Definitely. I agree. Well, that's kind of like the native culture. I wouldn't want someone to take something strange to, you know, I can gain access to a lot of native lands because I am a registered Cherokee Indian. So mm -hmm. most of the time to even talk with the chief or whoever's in charge on the reservations, they won't even look at you unless, unless you're registered. And, and I've already made contact with several people um, with the Cherokee Nation for when I get the series signed. And um, they want to make sure you're coming in and respecting the land. And I think that's why they want to make sure, are you registered with the tribe or a tribe? Because we don't want someone coming in here and once again, make it about demons and darkness, disrespect the culture, disrespect the torture that has happened. Someone even said you as an offering tobacco, chocolate, alcohol, produce, all that stuff. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Great ideas. Um, now, I wanted to just scoop into, is there any other plantations that you sort of looked up that you're, there was one more I talked about on the notes. Uh, let's see here. And it was... Um, there's Whitney, Magnolia. The LaLaurie mansion is so messed up, man. Like, she just was... She did Oh, that some... one in the French quarters, yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's in the French quarters. So people are always like, oh, the French quarters are, like, so haunted. Gee, I wonder why. Well, and, and it's it's fascinating when you read about where there was, like... It, it's one of those also you're trying to, to pick a way between the legend and the history like what was real what was not because it sounded like some of it was sensationalized but honestly there was apparently like rumors about her leading up to this and it was just because of a fire started that they found the horrors and the rest that had happened mm -hmm. when they came like they came into the house to put out the fire and what they discovered was something they were not expecting at all <laughs> right now oak alley plantation Okay. Now that one's one of the more popular ones known for having weddings as well that's in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, and it was known, I was shocked when I read this. So Oak Alley Plantations in Louisiana, it's, um, they say that uh, the actual core of it is sort of like a duplex structure, but it's quite large. So that kind of gives you an idea of how it looks if you haven't been there. Um, it was actually a sugar mill. And this is where I was shocked. So the plantation was alive for like the, the sugar mill between 1836 and 1844. And they had between 110 to 120 slaves on site. Mm. It's yeah. amazing that that could even occur. Oh yeah, well I mean uh, between sugar, tobacco and cotton, the, mm -hmm. the biggest thing were these were they needed a lot of people they needed a lot of manpower for these because i mean sugar apparently was very difficult to grow and they could only really grow it uh down in louisiana and in south florida because it was warm enough the humidity had like, yeah because anywhere any anywhere north it was too cold well it also Cause said because uh, this place was so big apparently the fields here were just ridiculous obviously but they're yeah. saying that they had 18 hour shifts and they would cut and mill the sugar cane and the other things that they harvested. And a lot of others labored as blacksmiths, carriage drivers, and drivers and gardeners that were on site. Um, yeah. And then the majority of them were considered field slaves. Mm -hmm. And that's just well, as young as 12 years old. Oh, yeah. It was it's basically the idea of, like, if you, if you could do the manual labor that they put... They put them to work and like the machinery too was just so dangerous like yeah if you ever seen the the sugar cane machines that like uh they put the the canes through to pull the sugar out it's like you get your hands like basically just ground up in that and similar to the cotton mills and you know even if people can't see the side of the slavery happen i don't mm -hmm. know how it isn't uh, 
you said glossed over. I really like that statement because that's really accurate. Mm-hmm. It's amazing that the children that were the slaves, like 12 year 12, that's a child. That's not a, an adult, a laborer, an adult. Can't, can't these people that are investigating at these locations just see that? That there were children that were there that probably didn't... What kid minds people? Nobody, you know? All kids push boundaries. They were probably beat, hurt, killed, tortured. So just not... If you can't see the side of the slavery, because I feel like it's just so accepted as a part of our history, why is it so overlooked that there were probably children that were slaves that were also tortured and abused? I guess I just don't understand how people can't have heart that have been to these locations that investigate and don't see this this in depth as like the the paranormal you're investigating is because there are many layers to trauma that took place on this ground. Hmm. And I mean I like deep it, trauma, you know? Yeah, I think part of it is not always so much accepting it, it's more just how do you like try and figure out how to approach it because it is such a a dark part of our history that we're still I mean still unpacking to this day and Mm -hmm. still trying to understand the whys of it and everything I mean Mm -hmm. I mean I have freaking stacks of books just on the topic alone and there's so much there to sift through and go through and everything my dog is barking I didn't know for sure I didn't know my dog was in here who, which one is it? I have too many dogs. I have four dogs, and I'm like, one of you snuck in here during my stream, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> literally. So the ghosts that are at the Oak Alley Plantation, or what they say haunts it, is um, the tour guides have had, like, lamps and light fixtures turn on. Apparently there's a place called the Lavender Room that's really haunted. Um they see, like, illuminations of people walking through, like, shadows. They're never really bothered, which is interesting. Um, but a oh, shadow... Go ahead. Guys at that point. They're like, yep, whatever. George right. is here again. <laughs> right. Which is interesting, because I, I don't think it's Theo, Cat. I don't know who it is. I don't know who's in here. It's, Odie. it's in. Odie. It's my corgi. My oh, corgi oh. snuck in here. He's He always sneaks behind me. Um... I was at a location called the Ferris Mansion that was in um, southern Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful mansion. And at the time um, I was filming, I had a girl that was sort of my co-host. Her name was SJ. And SJ was um, half black, half white. And uh, inside of this mansion, when we investigated, they had a maid's quarters. And the mm-hmm. maid's quarters was um, where they had kept people that were slaves, essentially, back in the day. And, or like the servants, you know what I mean? They were the, the black servants. And SJ absolutely loved that area. Like, she was comfortable. She felt, like, alive and excited to be in there. And when I was in there, I got this, like, malevolent, like, get out, like, you are not welcome in here type of vibe. And that's not your place. It's absolutely. Your place. Yeah. Like the white blonde girl is not welcome here, like whatsoever. You know what I mean? So it, it is interesting. And I, that's why I wish she would have stayed on with me because I would have loved to have an African culture on my, on, on the crew. You know what I mean? Cause I really feel like that would help balance out for any location that we go to. Um, but she, it was really interesting the perspectives that she would get from a location of that historical stance versus the energy that I got. And once again, I feel like that's not portrayed either on TV. Mm-mm. We miss that. Like that, that could be a whole nother side of evidence that I think oh. we miss. Um, I'm going to go down. So then just about the voodoo queen, as we all know, she was born in 1801 to a freed slave her mother was a freed slave and then her mother got pregnant by a wealthy businessman um who i believe was part choctaw indian and um, as we all know the voodoo queen ruled new orleans for many many years and that was you know also women at that time that's women empowerment how do you become a voodoo queen in 1801 like you know well she was born in 1801 but i mean you get it girl that's a hard time for her to have made such a statement for herself 
from birth, she was given the title. It makes you wonder, like, you know, was it because her heritage, like, mixed with African culture, and obviously she divulged that with her voodoo, mixed with her dad being Native American? Well, in a sense, and if you read about it, like, talk about that during the daytime, she was a hairdresser. That like, she dressed people, uh, the the um, wealthy um, people in New Orleans, she dressed their hair and fixed them and everything. And they would also ask her, she would also, on like, she would do also charms and spells and everything. And, I mean, from what it sounds like, it's like you had her and then, Possibly her daughter took over her because there's always mm-hmm. this like story about Marie Laveau living for an extremely long time, but it's the possibility that her daughter just took over and took on her name and continued as Marie Laveau mm-hmm. the second or just Marie Laveau and as well. But it's like you have someone who has basically the end to what was going on with the town and who was talking to who and what was doing what. And right. that was probably very helpful. Absolutely. Well, they. I think it's said to um, the voodoo queen, I feel like people know her more as that. Her great-grandmother mm-hmm. is the one that came to New Orleans as a slave from West Africa around 1743. So mm-hmm. she knew her roots, and that was obviously in the French Quarter as well, where she got prominent with women of color and white aristocrat women um, mm-hmm. sort of worshipped her as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's some power. Yeah, because you, you had... You had uh, Congo Square, you had people um, who, like, I think it was, was it on Sunday? Like, she would, they would see her there at Congo Square doing events, and they were, it, like, she was known, like, she was known on site, even though we have very few pictures of her. We have pictures we think is her, but we're not 100% sure. She's still so worshipped. She was- I would die to go to her. Have you ever been to her grave? Uh, no, I did not get a chance to go to her but I did, <sighs> uh, <laughs> I do miss going to New Orleans. It was a beautiful place. And yeah, no, it's like there are statues of her, there are candles to her, like you definitely can make offerings and petition her for things, basically like, almost like a saint. Right, I, I, I want, like, we'll make a trip, Elfie, you and I, okay? We're gonna go <laughs> down there, I want to touch her grave, I want to leave flowers, like, I just think it's amazing, like, not even from the voodoo queen side, which I know that was her title, but mm-hmm. being a woman in the 1800s, if she was born in 1801, that means she probably didn't predominantly start till she was about, what, 1820-ish, somewhere in there, to be at that time your own boss like entrepreneur in a time of slavery like bitch you get it like you got it girl like you you ruled this town like you get it mm-hmm. that yeah, enough was, is enough for me to worship you know what i mean oh yeah she was considered a free woman and actually i think there were like two or three places that are rumored like there there's one place they consider as possibly great but then there's two other places their debate as well because they're not sure which one is the actual one and then there's the whole like uh, people putting the three X's on her grave mm-hmm. with the uh, charcoal and then I'm not sure do you remember a few years ago when someone actually painted the the grave? I didn't remember that. Did they get in trouble for it? Uh, I think it was about five, six years ago. Someone painted it pink? I want to say it was pink. Yeah, it was with a latex paint. They painted it pink to cover over the X's. I don't know if they ever captured the person, but they were luckily able to get the paint off because their main worry is because it was a latex, if how much damage could possibly happen to the stonework because it was like it's old stone and right. everything. But yeah, they apparently got painted over someone like took a bucket of paint and painted over it and everything. But wow. I can't remember if they actually caught the person. Why I don't people just di- shouldn't disrespect. Uh, that's one way to get cursed. Well, and the problem is, is like they they uh, after that I believe they closed off that cemetery to only do tours. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't. I don't believe it was a. It used to be you could walk through that cemetery and be fine. But after that, they the people who owned it just like closed off to only people who do tours and then uh, funerals and stuff. They wow. weren't allowing England just to wander through because someone... Defacing someone... a grave marker, yeah. I mean, that's... 
Pe- the, you know, I love humans that are good humans, but then there's just some really dumb humans, too, and I'm just like, y'all need some Jesus or something. Like, why, why would, you know, and if, obviously, they wanted to get rid of the exes, you know? Yeah, the I thought think they were process is, like, what were you thinking? Why? Like, why are you doing like, that? So, not a, not a good idea, because I think they were worried if they power washed it off that it would have taken, like, chunks of stone off. I bet. I mean, that's ancient stone. Who knows even how they made it back then, how it was mixed. Well, I mean, they were enough with all the X's put on to it, because apparently they do have to, to wash that off after a while, because so many people were putting would put X's on the grave and whatnot, they would have to clean it off. Wow. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I love her story. She's one of my faves. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely one of my faves. I'd love to... I think the house that she grew up in has been demolished, but there's another location that has been built on that land, which I believe was her father's land. It's not necessarily a plantation. It's just a big home. But I'd love to go there. I'm, I'm assuming, you know, all of Louisiana, the South is haunted, and it, that would be an amazing journey. That would be an amazing journey. Yeah, I think the, the building... Possibly the building where she worked out of, like, that she did her, her hair work, because I think she did... There was a shop, but possibly also she did out of her house, too. Mm-hmm. That might be around, because it's not a very big house, if I remember correctly. It's, like, it's quite small. That I just think it's amazing. Because even... It's funny, because that'll tie into kind of ending our stream, and for next week... Next week, Kat and I will be doing a... Oh, that's going to be a good one. I mean, this week was a <laughs> controversial stream, but next week's going to be a good one. I mean, this was good, too. But, um, you know, with Women's Heritage Month, obviously, giving ode to different cultures and different empowering women um, and even, like, things that we've had to overcome as females in our society and tying it in with paranormal, you know, women's asylums, man. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some tea next week spilled, and there's going to be a lot of shocking things. We have the lovely Elfie who will be doing our research for us next week, which we're so excited because Elfie's really into this topic. It's one of her favorite topics. Um, yeah, but the like this and this and oh my God, how about this? <laughs> it's going to be like a four hour stream next week. So everybody just be prepared. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Kat and I are dying to at the chomping at the bit for the next stream. We've already done a little bit of research on it and some shocking things we didn't know about women's asylums that have come up. Um, because, you know, women were kind of considered property, too, which is just crazy to me. Um, Kat saw something today that made me laugh that I kind of wanted to share for the end of the stream. And what she saw was um, a meme that said you should be as a society, you should be happy that women just want equality and not revenge. <laughs> and I feel like that's a pretty accurate statement some days. You know what I mean? And it sucks because it does tie into us here with paranormal and women in paranormal because we're still facing inequality with this. And I feel like in 2021, man, we should just be, let's get the ball rolling here. Like, why are we still stuck in the dark ages? You know what I mean? Like, I told you when I went on this journey, it wasn't supposed to be a feminist journey. And then I had so many doors slap in my face because I was a female and I was just like, what is happening? Yep. You know? So we're excited. So thank you so much, Elfie. I will let you go. We appreciate you for being here. Uh, Thank you, guys. See y'all. So I will just kind of do my outro really quickly with you guys as we let Elfie go there. And... uh, Make sure you guys are following us on social media. Next week's going to be an awesome, awesome stream. Um, I can't wait for it. Uh, I've never divulged a lot into women's asylums. One of the reasons I made the decision to do the topic of women's asylums isn't just because of International Women's Day, Women's Month. When Kat and I were preparing to um, shoot the first pilot we got in contact with several women's asylums on the West Coast. And uh, they are abandoned, yet they are owned, privately owned. And Kat and I wanted to do some research and we thought it would be really cool as rare women crew um, in Paranormal to go to some female-only asylums. And unfortunately, we were met with some really strange responses, um, and I'm not going to 
share those till next week with Kat. Um, Because Kat did most of the negotiating and talking during that time. I will just say that most of the time the door was slammed in our face very quickly. It's sort of like they want to hide the fact that torturous, once again, dark things happened on these grounds to women. And they didn't want to allow us to film because they didn't want the truth to sort of come out. And that's really a shame. So... Just so you guys know, you know, as as you guys know, we're still planning on shooting a pilot, uh, another, another pilot. Um, Elfie is discussing doing the research for us when we find a location. I still need to find two more females for camera tech work. So that's something I'm going to have to do next. But if we get signed, I would love to zero in on locations surrounding female imprisonment, female torture, maybe that's female jails um, that have shut down, maybe that's um, female locations uh, like asylums that where torture happened, that they've been abandoned since, you know, the 60s and 70s. And another uh, ode that I'd love to do is, is incorporating culture, because I feel like a lot of culture hasn't been incorporated. Um, and that includes not only my native heritage, but other cultures that I feel like have sort of been left out. Um, my favorite sort of places to go investigate are the nooks and crannies of like the bed and breakfasts that are in the middle of nowhere that nobody knows about. Um, so I have some really good plans going for my next pitch um, for whenever I get in touch with another executive producer, probably when quarantine finally ends. Um, but it's interesting because although quarantine has been tough. I I wanted to just address this quickly with you guys. I was going to post some videos this week, uh, pre-recorded, edited for the YouTube channel, and I didn't. And I wanted to tell you why. I had a tough week. This week um, was the first week I had a mental health week where I struggled from the pandemic. And I wanted to share that publicly because I think mental health is extremely important I've always been a mental health advocate and I want to make sure that people know they're not alone. You know, like this has been a tough year and a half year we're going on with um, the pandemic and being on lockdown and stuff and uh, political issues aside, we've all struggled at some point in the last 12 months and I'm included in that as well. And I had a tough week, but I, I, so I kind of took the week off to sort of uh, regroup my brain and just give myself a mental health break. But with that, I came to conclusion that if I wouldn't have had quarantine for the last 12 months with Kat being one of, Kat and I are like best buds, you know, like we are each other's therapists. Um, Kat and I have grown a lot from quarantine and my perspective on the way I will shoot the series once it's signed has changed a lot. Um, And I think that I feel blessed for having quarantine and I've seen the positive side of it because it's given me some time to really slow down and think. Obviously, we couldn't just go out and shoot a pilot while this was going on and lockdown was happening. Um, Obviously, we need new gear, which is why I have subscriptions set up for YouTube. But I, I want you guys to know, like, as tough as it's been, try to see any of the self improvement that has happened over the 12 months, even if it's been the smallest thing. Even if it's just been trying to get into a work routine from home. Even if you're trying and you haven't succeeded, understand you've still done something. You don't have to be perfect. You're human. This is part of the human journey, which is sometimes struggling. And that's okay because we're empathetic beings and we feel. And I just really wanted to share that with you guys. I thought it was important. Um, Before quarantine, I would have never considered uh, when I shoot the series when it's signed because it will be signed. It will be signed at some point or another. I don't know how. I don't know care. I don't care. It will be signed at some point. Um, but without quarantine, I would never have thought to utilize the struggles I've had as a woman in film and as a woman in paranormal and use that for fuel with the series, such as female-oriented locations. So I am very, very grateful for this year and having the time to think and regroup and uh, process and even Elfie coming in our life like 
I've known Elfie for a few, what, four or five years. We've chatted on and off, and then we decided to start streaming together in January, and now here we're going on maybe a little bit of a professional working relationship for the future. And it's all about that divine timing, and everything comes to you in perfect time. And be patient with yourself, because I got really frustrated this week um, from stress, from just being home. I just wanted to go to like lunch with my friends and like I usually have lots of friends come in town from Vegas and I haven't seen anybody in like a year. And just be patient with yourself and we're going to make it and I think we're we're heading out to the end of this whole crazy crazy times and we survived a pandemic, y'all. If there's anything you can be happy about even if you haven't felt like you've accomplished anything, there's something you did accomplish. We survived a pandemic, barely, but we survived it. So anyway, make sure you're following us on social media. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already to support our journey to pilot number two. Make sure you guys are here. Give us a like, thumbs up, and as always, I will catch you guys next time. Bye, guys. Back from the dead.